Hello, hi, good evening. So this is Krishna Veni and we are here talking about the story of life on earth and that's biology. So hi SRK, okay you are SRK study point. Alright, so yes, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Hello Gopal, good afternoon. So hope you had a heavy lunch. Yes, but it's good evening. So here we go with good evening. Yes, so there's someone new, Satyapal K.R. Pandit. So hello, how are you? So thank you so much for joining my session guys. So today we are here in lecture 1. So it's a new topic. So we're going to talk about the applications of biotechnology. Achha, okay. So hello Aman, thank you for coming again. Good evening Priyanka, thank you for joining us. Harini, good evening. Yes. I'm not coming. Okay, so there was a problem with the app, so I didn't come for the class today. So all the classes were cancelled in the morning. That's why. All right. Okay, so you missed our class today. Is that so? Yes, even I missed the class today. So here it's okay. We'll compensate for this class. So since it's the start of a new topic and you are here, so hope this goes interesting. So for all those who are new, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, I teach for class 12. And for the remaining three days, that is Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday, I teach for class 11. So in class 11, we are talking about your animal kingdom. And on class 12, I have started your biotechnology. So we are done with the principles and process. That is, I am done with the introduction to your biotechnology. And today we are going to talk about the applications of biotechnology. And so the name says, theory, putting theory into reality. So that is applications of biotechnology. Okay, so you also missed me. All right, so thank you. Don't worry, we'll be back soon on track, okay, fine. So I have another important announcement to make. So today is Wednesday, so every alternate day we play quiz, right? We have a fun game, so that is our mode of entertainment. So today as well at 6.30 p.m., so stay tuned, I have my quiz. It's a Wendy quiz, short quiz for 15 questions and 20 seconds for each question and the topic is human diseases, all right? So it is at 6.30 p.m. this evening. So I hope to see all those who said hi here, come there and I want to see you on the wall of fame as well. So hope you have prepared. So it is only the disease part, I am not going deep into uh, other things. So mostly I have focused only on diseases like your bacterial infection, your fungal infection followed by your cancer and AIDS. So that is all the 15 questions are about. So I gave you a hint as well. So if you are actually preparing, so this is the clue that you should take up. Alright, so again after this lecture I will meet you at 6.30. Yes, so please do bring in all your friends who it is at home because it's a game. So anyone can play PUBG, right? It's not a restriction that only kids should play, elders should not play. So don't worry. So bring everyone. Everyone can play quiz. It's a normal quiz. It's about diseases. It's about allergy. So it will be a lot of fun. So more the people you bring, the more the fun we are going to have. All right. So it's my humble request. So please do share my link. And as well, bring a lot of your friends, even your juniors, seniors, it does not matter. Okay? Fine. So here we go. So talking about the previous topic, because that was the introduction to this chapter, that was a prerequisite to what biotechnology actually means. So what were we talking about in the previous chapter? Okay, so you haven't gone through. It's okay. Even if you haven't gone through, come look into the questions. What if you remember? What if you have... What if a magic happens and you remember all the answers? For example, let me give a clue. So you know what are the bacterial infections, right? So bacterial infections are what? For example, your salmonella typhi is a bacteria. So that is a type of bacterial infection. What if you get a question like this? What if your luck plays a role today? Never miss an opportunity. Just come, play, so you gain experience, right? So that is more important. So don't just sit back scaring that, no, I haven't revised. I don't know anything, so I'm not coming, no. What if something happens? What if a miracle happens? So please do come and join. So there's nothing wrong. So it's not that you are in a compulsion to win. It is just a fun game. As long as you're exposed to the questions, I am happy. And the winner, losers are all part of the game. So you don't have to worry much about it. All right, Priyanka. So please do come. Look into the questions at least. All right. Yes. Okay. 
so a prerequisite to the applications of biotechnology is your application is your principles and process of biotechnology so in the previous chapter i have been explaining to you what is biotechnology and what are the tools behind it what are we expecting out of biotechnology so what is the sole purpose of biotechnology so why am i talking about biotechnology again and again what is the cost what is the effect what is the consequence what is the impact so all these matters all right so we have defined biotechnology so how did we define biotechnology it is a use of living no 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 so this is the problem right so make up a balanced mindset it's okay if you don't win you will get demotivated but look at the positive side you are exposed to questions you know which topics you have not prepared you will know how thorough you are right so it does not matter don't worry don't get demotivated so it is not a do or die situation so i am giving you ample opportunities so every alternate day i am giving you menti so please make use of the opportunity so there's nothing to get demotivated all right yes so you come every day but didn't come on the leaderboard so yes so you take time to read questions then so the more and more you practice the better you will become all right so guys don't get demotivated it is after all a game okay fine <coughs> so we define biotechnology as the use of living organisms to produce a final product it can be either a protein uh either a drug etc so many things so what how is it being done so how is your principle of biotechnology being followed so what are the steps behind it so we first spoke about your recombinant dna technology how to take a new dna or a new sequence right and then insert it into an existing sequence so that is recombinant dna technology so we named it as are you ready to alter your dna yes so we saw how it is being done and here we are going to apply the theory into the technique all right yes i understand it is about your performance but it does not matter as long as you are being exposed to questions okay don't worry fine so that is about recombinant dna technology and we were seeing about the tools of our dna technology so recombinant dna technology is in short called as our dna technology so what are the tools behind this recombinant dna technology first was your restriction enzymes so what did we talk about your restriction enzymes so they belong to a class of nucleases right they belong to a family of a broader enzymes called as nucleases and nucleases can be exonuclease or endonuclease so these nucleases or your restriction enzyme act as molecular scissors they help in chopping off your gene of interest so if you remember so that is the term we have been talking about time and again yes <coughs> so it is used to chop off your gene of interest so you chop off your gene of interest clone it in a vector yes so your next tool is your cloning vector so what are the ideal features of your cloning vector it should have a origin of replication yes so followed by it should have your selectable markers and it should be able to a uh, selective recombinants from non recombinants transformants from non transformants so all these things are very important so which one act as your selectable markers all your antibiotic resistance gene right so this is what we have been talking in the previous chapter so followed by your competent host so how should your host be so your host should be compatible to receive the external dna that is your foreign dna right so these are the three tools of your recombinant dna technology and this is a prerequisite to today's chapter that is applications of biotechnology all right yes so here these are the steps in detail that we followed first we isolated your dna yes if you want to isolate your gene of interest from a particular organism you just take that portion you you chop it off from the remaining cell okay remaining chromosomal dna so that is isolation then you digest it you cut it with the help of your restriction enzymes and then you cross check if your digestion has worked with the help of your gel electrophoresis and then how do you isolate from gel electrophoresis through the process of elution right and then you amplify it you amplify that particular gene of interest using your pcr 
then ligation of DNA fragment into the vector and then you put it inside a cloning vector and once you have inserted inside a cloning vector, you put it inside a host. So what is most important is how quickly it is being expressed. So that is the ultimate aim, right? So you check whether it is being expressed and then finally you do the downstream processing that is purification, right? So these are the steps in detail about your recombinant technology. Now we are going to follow these steps practically into an application. So that is more important. How practical is a particular technique used? So these are the steps and we are going to see how practically it is possible. All right. Yes. So in the last class when I was talking about the previous chapter, so this is the last slide I showed you. So once we are done culturing your microorganisms, once your protein is ready, Purification is more important when you're talking on a commercial term. So when I say your ready-made insulin is available, so would you trust me if I say the insulin is purified? I have to show you some evidence, right? I have to prove it. So there are uh, tests that I have to do before I sell it in the market, right? So how, how do I produce a purified insulin? How do I produce a purified product? And I also should ensure it should not have any cross reaction on you. So if I am giving you insulin, it should only play the role of your insulin. It should not cross react. It should not give you any consequences. So that is more important when I make it commercial. So that is a problem with your COVID-19 vaccine as well. So what is happening? So you have cross reactions happening, you have consequences coming up. So it is not completely acting on the situation of need, but what it is doing, it is in turn invoking other reactions. So that is not how it should be. So if I am producing an artificial insulin, it should only act as insulin and the product should be purified without any contamination because you are playing with the lives of people. All right. So how do you purify a particular product? It is only separation and purification and that separation and purification technique is called as downstream processing. Fine. So this is what happens. First you do the process of recombination. You pick up your gene of interest here. You pick up your gene of interest. Select the particular strain. You chop it off with your restriction enzyme. You clone it inside a vector. You select your recombinant vectors here and then you culture it in a media. Okay, you express it in a lot of bacteria and you culture the bacteria here inside a fermenter and finally you purify because ultimately you don't need the bacteria as a whole. You only need your plasmids, right? That is your recombinant plasmids. So you isolate only the recombinant plasmids. So that is your purified class. Okay, all right. So this is what is happening in your downstream processing. Fine? Okay? Yes. So going forward to today's topic. <coughs> so what is biotechnology? So biotechnology is a process, it's a technique, it's a phenomenon you can say that you have been using since a long time. So this is one interesting thing. So biotechnologists are called as the doctors of doctor of a cell because we, basically we uh, talk about the cell in detail. So in and out about a cell, only a biotechnologist knows, not a physiological doctor, right? So it is only a biotechnologist. So they have the privilege of being called the doctor of a cell. So what is the history of biotechnology? So the history of biotechnology has something to tell us. And let's see what it says. The gene revolution may be sweeping us along at breathtaking speed, but biotechnology is as old as bread and cheese. So what is uh, uh, so? What do I mean by as old as bread and cheese? So that is very common, right? So how do you get your bread? How do you get your cheese? Everything through the process of fermentation. So would you get bread without yeast? Not possible. Would you get cheese without microbes? Definitely not. So today you have so many varieties of che uh, cheese. So this cheese, that cheese, so everything has to be properly fermented and for all that you need microorganisms and the logic behind it is biotech, right? So here I have, so what is this cheese? So this is a cheese that comes in Tom and Jerry, right? So it's a very famous one. So how many of you have seen this cheese? It's called the Swiss cheese, the one that Jerry loves. So it is also a product of your uh, fermentation reaction of your microbes acting on it. So that is also one classic example. The next one, wine, yes, so you have heard this uh, logic, right? So the older the wine, the more tastier it is. So as long as you keep it undisturbed, untouched, so the more fermented it becomes and the taste is very good. So that is the logic behind wine. So wine also, it is uh, again the process of fermentation that is happening. Yes, good evening. 
and this is finely bread so every day so at least not in india but in foreign countries so your bread is the breakfast right so without yeast yeast you cannot imagine bread so everything comes from fermentation and the base is biotech so you may be in a world of so many things you may be in the era of technology the era of uh, digital world etc but biotechnology is as old as bread and cheese all right so that is the history behind biotechnology so going forward so what are the topics that we are going to discuss today so the first one we are going to talk about the critical areas of research in biotech so where are we going to apply this uh, phenomenon of recombinant dna technology in what aspects in what fields to solve what problems so just like that you cannot bring a technique into market and say i'm going to use it so you bring a technique only when when it is being a, when it is a problem right for example suppose we have a problem now we are in a pandemic situation and we are in need of a vaccine and that's why the world is expecting or awaiting a vaccine right so only when there is a problem the solution arises so what are the areas so first we have to sort out the problem and then go ahead with the solution wine have a foul odor because that is the fermentation of microbes yes sometimes some wine have a foul odor but if you have tasted the very ancient wine the oldest wine that's been kept for almost some 50 years 100 years it will not have such a foul smell it is it tastes very good okay uh, so you have some uh, pages on wine so there it give you so some wine have foul odor but your red wine will not have mostly because the more fermented it is the more tastier it is all right yes so we are first going to chart out the problems where we have problems in which areas and where we can apply the process of biotechnology the next one we are going to talk about in agriculture field so how it can be used in agricultural field then in the field of medicine which is very need it is the need of the hour right now and finally what are transgenic animals so why are we producing them what is the use what is the cost what is the effect and then finally ethical issues so remember we are dealing with live organisms live animals so ethical issue is a must okay but actually red wine is therapeutically good but you should know it is not that you do not drink and you should not know you should be aware it is a part and parcel of a lifestyle so you it is also a, a end product of your biotech so you should know how it is being produced what are the organisms that ferment it it's that it's nothing that it's bad so if you know it is bad then you should know the bad things as well only when you know something about it you can judge it's bad right so you should know everything in and out and then only you'll be able to judge whether it's good or bad all right so don't just arrive into a conclusion just like that fine so what are the critical areas of research so what are the areas that we are going to touch upon so the first one so providing best catalyst so i am just going to tell about in which field are we going to use biotechnology process where are we going to use so providing best catalyst in the form of improved organism so we are going to uh, so what are catalyst catalyst are enzyme right so we are going to enhance the reaction to enhance a particular reaction you need more amount of catalyst so more amount of enzyme so we are going to look for microorganisms which can provide us with efficient enzymes so that is the meaning of the sentence so providing best catalyst in the form of improved organism usually a microbe or a pure enzyme so you are artificially going to produce an enzyme okay from a living organism and thus use that enzyme to enhance a process okay yes so that should be your aim all right so creating optimal conditions through engineering a catalyst to act so you are going to create optimal conditions for the enzyme that you are going to produce all right then downstream process it so that you get a purified product yes fine for example this is this happens in all your cellular process so every cellular process in your body will need an enzyme but suppose if the efficiency of the enzyme is less the rate at which the product is being formed will also be less what if you can enhance the enzyme production so you artificially clone a gene that codes for an enzyme in a bacteria you clone the bacteria and you produce multiple copies so you have artificially produced enzymes right so that those enzymes can be used to enhance a cellular process yes hello lima so thank you for joining our session today so i guess you are a bit late we are already into the chapter talking about the applications of biotechnology but it does not matter all right so we have just begun 
okay so now why did i say we are going to talk about uh, biotechnology in application just give me a second Okay, so why are we going to talk about the applications of biotechnology in agriculture? So what was the need? So first we are going to analyze the problem here. So what was the first problem that came to us was, so though as humans we are approaching, we are moving ahead in all the fields. For example, we are pioneers. So we as humans are pioneers in the field of uh, transportation, autom automation, digital, everything, right? But where does the problem lie? So more we become developed in all the fields, the population is ever increasing so when we are talking about a more developed fields right so we are we forget to take care of the basic requirements such as food so the population is ever increasing but we are not able to manage with the food requirements something as basic as that so thus we are going to talk about how we can increase the production of food so that is the basic thing so increase in growth rate led to the basic requirements like food as a question mark. So what can be the solution since your problem is ever increasing. So day by day the population is increasing. So how are we going to meet the food requirements. So that was the first problem that came into picture and hence biotechnology will be used to solve that issue. So let's gradually see how this problem went on. So what was the first solution they came up with and finally where did they end and what was the success rate. All right. Okay, so there were three options which people considered. So the first option here was agrochemical based agriculture. So that was the first option that came into people's mind. So what is agrochemical based agriculture? So the use of chemical products. So they started using chemical products, chemical pesticides, fertilizers to grow more crops. So that was the first option. The second option was organic agriculture or farming. So where you stopped your chemicals, where you went on to more of a bio-based things. So bio-fertilizers, bio-pesticides, bio-controls, etc. And the third one is genetically engineered crops. So these genetically engineering crops were also one of the option that occurred to people. So solve the problem of uh, food shortage. All right. So these were the three options people considered. And what did they go forward with? First thing they thought about green revolution. So it is one of a very common phenomena that happened to increase the food supply. So what did they exactly do? So what are the criteria that they followed? So what was the strategy that they followed? So the first one, Norman E. Borlag was the father of your green revolution. So you should remember this person's name. He's a very common uh, for, um, person in the field of green revolution it was he who has, who started but what actually did they do in green revolution so it's a very common term right green revolution green revolution but what exactly happened in green revolution so it is a period where significant increase in agricultural productivity was seen but how did they do it so they used improved crop varieties that they used only high yielding crop varieties not all crop varieties were considered for example there can be a particular crop where the yield is less but still you spend time and energy harvesting that crop so those were stopped only a high yielding crops were concentrated on the next thing better management practices for example the proper use of fertilizers irrigation techniques so all that saves your time all that saves your efforts also so that was also followed in your green revolution and the last one the use of agrochemicals like fertilizers, pesticides. So farmers were made aware of what are the fertilizers available, what are the pesticides available. So you give them that particular fertilizer which is more efficient. So all the, these are all the strategies that was followed for your green revolution. Okay. So early success was seen in Mexico followed by your Indian subcontinent. So green revolution succeeded in one way that is tripling the food supply. 
the amount of food supply produced was triple so that was one successful aspect about your green revolution all right but though the amount of food supply was tripled it was not enough to meet your requirements the still the population was ever increasing though it had so many advantages so many better way to enhance your production it also had some limitation for example a coin has two sides right head and tail so everything in your life also has a good and a bad version so similarly green revolution also had its own disadvantages so what are the disadvantages what are the limitations so let's see first thing agrochemicals were expensive your farmers could not afford them so that was the first issue and hence green revolution could not be continued the next reason all varieties now were not possible with the conventional technique so that was also an issue so i said only high yielding varieties were concentrated but the growth of all the varieties were not possible with the conventional technique and the last one though you use chemical fertilizers though they are costly yes i agree but your chemical fertilizers at the end of the day they are chemicals that is harmful to the environment so we are also responsible for the future of your future generation right so our ancestors thought about us so we at least have an environment to live with the one that you polluted you and i are responsible but what about our future generation so what are we going to give our kids and grandkids just a polluted environment so when you think from that aspect of view that was also a limitation to your green revolution so that was also one of the major concerns so with this your green revolution slow down people started thinking people started waking up oh no it also has a major consequence so they stopped fine yes so what is the solution they brought about actually your green revolution itself was was a solution to the ever increasing population now your green revolution itself had so many limitations now what solution did they come up with next so the next solution they came up with was the use of genetically modified crops so it was a very uh, possible solution very feasible one so it gave a new dimension to your crop breeding so it was a new thought new coming so it was possible so with the help of gene cloning this was possible yes so you gave birth to genetically modified plants so you have a lot of plants today <coughs> sorry yes so two strategies were used before your genetically modified crops were being produced so one it is your gene addition so your plant is there as such you're just including a gene into it so you have your entire plant genome you're just adding a particular gene into it that is a particular gene addition to the existing set so that is called as gene addition the next one is called as gene suppression so gene suppression is you delete that particular gene for example it is it is able to produce a particular toxin so you delete the toxin uh, encoding gene so that is called as gene suppression so these two strategies were kept in mind and hence the process of genetically modified crops were taken forward so what are genetically modified organisms so as a definition i have it here so plants bacteria fungi followed by animals whose genes have been altered is called as genetically modified organisms or they are also called as transgenic animals fine so this is the definition of gmos or transgenic animals so gmos are genetically modified organisms so transgenic plants so here our approach was to in agriculture so the first uh, method that came to picture was transgenic plants so before we could even think of transgenic animals so today we have transgenic dogs today you have transgenic cows so very soon we'll have transgenic humans as well no wonder but it all started with your transgenic plants so let's see so genetic modification has made crops more tolerant to abiotic stresses meaning a plant is able to withstand cold conditions drought conditions salt and heat conditions so these are natural problems right so when your plant is able to withstand all these conditions it will definitely give us a good yield so we have modified genes so that they can survive against your abiotic stresses so your abiotic abiotic this does not have a life so your cold drought salt and heat fine so once you started genetically modifying plants so your dependency on chemical pesticides reduced right okay so adil rashid future doctor hi so hello so help to reduce the post harvest losses so you do not have any post harvest losses as well 
fourth one you also you, you are also able to maintain the fertility of your soil without any problem because you're not adding fertilizers you're just modifying the plant so that is also one reason so fifth one enhanced nutritional value so this was also one basic uh, strategy so you were able to produce a high quality product so not only plants okay so you change the gene of a plant and hence the product is different so sometimes you change the gene of a plant so that the plant is able to produce efficient things sometimes you change the gene of a plant so that the product is modified for example in a normal rice plant so if you do a gene modification technique you have what is called as a vitamin a enriched rice that is your golden rice so these were all the outcomes of your genetic modification and thus your transgenic plant was taken forward okay okay so this is one example of your transgenic uh, gmo actually so it is called the golden rice so it is a transgenic variety of rice so again what does transgenic means modifying the organism's existing genome gives you transgenic okay so it is a modified variety of oryza sativa so oryza sativa is your rice plant so you are genetically modifying it to produce golden rice so what is this golden rice it contains a lot of quantity of your beta carotene so why do we need beta carotene it is a pro vitamin a so it is needed to convert or produce your vitamin a in your body all right so vitamin a is essential because it is needed in the formation it is needed for your vision etc right so that is why people require a lot of vitamin a but what is the agenda behind your golden rice why out of nowhere they are talking about rice because if you take the world's population half the kids are malnutrition so you and i have a balanced diet but if you choose or if i choose to eat a balanced diet is a different story but we are all affordable for a balanced diet yet we don't take so every day do you take proteins vitamins and minerals definitely not so one day you take one or monthly once you take any of the vitamins or minerals but talking about the world population half the world population did not have access to a balanced diet so in that case what is affordable to them is rice so people thought why not modify the rice with a lot of beta carotene at least the vitamin part is being consumed by the kids so that was the agenda behind your golden rice all right so they enrich the gene that that has beta carotene and hence the golden rice so this is how it looked so it gives you a lot of enriched vitamin a fine so now talking about the gm plants so gm plants are widely used in the pharmaceutical industry for the production of hirudin bio brassica napus so brassica napus is a particular type of plant so i guess i have the picture yes so this is your brassica napus so this is used in the production of hirudin so it can be used as a recombinant protein or a therapeutic protein so in that case also not only to produce your rice tomato etc to also in the pharmaceutical field also your transgenic plants are modified all right apart from that the alternate production of fuel for so many ways your plants are being modified fine okay so the first uh, reason or the first known thing why your plant was being transgenically modified is your bt cotton so what was the issue so in india you have a lot of textile industries right so people look forward to a lot of huge harvest huge uh, yield right but in between these plants are being eaten by insects so thus the yield is being lost so people wanted to come up with a solution so what did they do they modified your cotton plant so how did they modify the modified version is called as bt cotton so what did what does bt mean so bt actually stands for bacillus thuringiensis so it is a bacteria so what was the problem so the cotton plant did not give us a good harvest because during the uh, season they were being eaten or fed by insects so they want to stop that but how will they stop that they did not want to use pesticides they did not want to use fertilizers but how did they use that all right brassica napus brassica napus we have also read in your morphology so quickly go find out so i have told you so tell me what is the common name of brassica we have already read it in your morphology of flowering plants so it and tell me what is the example of it you should not forget okay so how did they come about 
so they first went and found this bacteria okay that is bacillus thuringiensis so this bacteria is able to produce a protein that can kill the insects which feeds on your cotton plant so what are the classes of insects lepidopterans so these are classes of your worms that feed on your cotton plant so cleopterans are your beetles and finally diopterans are your flies and mosquitoes all right so these are the classes so these are the classes of insects that are acting on your cotton plant and we have to kill them so this particular bacteria that is called as bacillus thuringiensis they can produce a protein which will kill these organisms but how okay so let me erase it <coughs> okay so they form protein crystals during a particular phase of their life cycle so that protein has a toxic part so when i say it is toxic you should ask me is it not toxic for the bacteria no it is not toxic for the bacteria itself because the toxin is produced in a inactive form so as long as the toxin is inside the insect it is an in inactive form sorry as long as the toxin is inside the bacteria the toxin is an inactive form so once the in, uh, in, in insects for example these kind of insects they ingest this bacteria the toxin protein inside the bacteria becomes active so how does it become active because the moment the insect ingests the bacteria it gets exposed to an alkaline ph so alkaline ph converts the inactivated toxin into a toxic form so hence killing the insect so this bacteria it produces a particular protein so that protein crystals are formed during a particular phase of that insect all right so that is called as a insecticidal protein so cidal is killing so the bacteria produces an insecticidal protein meaning it is a protein that will kill insects okay so these proteins exist in an inactive state and the moment it enters the gut of the insect so insect is this and this is bacteria don't confuse so this is producing a protein that is going to kill all of them how so this protein inside the bacteria is inactive the moment the organism ingests this bacteria so this protein will become activated how by exposing to the alkaline ph of the gut so inside the insect you have an alkaline ph in the gut so the moment the bacteria comes in contact with the alkaline ph the inactive toxin is being activated all right so now the activated toxin binds to the surface of the midgut epithelial cells so it's a toxin when it binds to the surface it creates spores so once spores are created your cell lyses and the organism dies so it was a very brilliant idea to come up because it was one one step solution where the entire problem has been sorted so now you do not have a problem in the cotton harvest and hence you can go forward with a high production right so you did not use chemical pesticides you do not you use fertilizers you do not have any manpower nothing so it was just one step what did you do you in uh, you, you actually made bacillus thuringiensis cotton you modified the plant right so you actually took the gene of the bacillus thuringiensis that codes for your protein and then you inactivated it in the plant so the moment it's been inserted into the plant it will produce a protein that in toxic form okay sorry in a prototoxin form and the moment the toxin is produced and the insect comes and bite so the moment it's been ingested so it will be dead right so it was a very brilliant solution so how practically it was done so bt that is bacillus thuringiensis in the form of powder or spray was sprayed on the field so moment it was sprayed the organism is intact right so it is a bacteria you and i cannot see a bacteria so it is sprayed on the fields the moment the insect comes and feeds on the plant it also injects the bacteria and the bacteria will produce the protein and hence the organism is killed so your efficiency is not lost your yield is not lost so it was one brilliant approach all right so the gene that codes for this protein is called as a cry gene the gene is called as cry gene and the proteins are different okay so proteins encoded by the gene so these are the genes they control ball worms okay so cry is the gene and these are the proteins encoded by the gene so cry 1 ac cry 1 ab they control your cotton ball worms because your leopterans are basically the classes of worms 
So cry 1 AB controls your corn borer. Again, it is a type of insect that feels on your cotton plant. All right. So you understood why BT cotton came into existence to control the act of pesticides on your cotton plant because these insects when they feed on cotton plant your efficiency your yield is being reduced thus they wanted to stop the feeding of insects on the plants so how did they do so they took up this bacteria that is your bacillus thuringiensis which will, which will produce a toxic protein and they sprayed it on the fields so it was one step easy solution so this is your modified BT cotton which is giving us maximum yield today without any problem. So this was one successful work of biotechnology in the market. So this is that fantastic organism Bacillus thuringiensis, which can produce the protein crystal. The protein crystal is also known as insecticidal protein. So cidel is killing. But why the protein does not kill the bacteria itself? Because inside the bacteria, it is in a protoxin state. All right. Yes. Okay. So that was one approach that we saw in detail about the role of biotechnology in agriculture. So what was the next approach? So the next approach is pest resistant plants. The first thing was you have to ensure the insects do not eat the cotton plant. So you use Bacillus thuringiensis, but that is not possible in all cases, right? So here you wanted to have a pest resistant plant. So in what case? For example, your tobacco plant had a lot of pests eating them and hence the yield was less. So what can you do in this case? So you had a nematode. So this nematode infects the roots of tobacco plant and it causes a reduction in yield. So this was the major problem and tobacco is also mainly used. So if tobacco yield is reduced and hence the whole industry goes down. So what solution can you bring? Again, you can't use pest pesticides. It is harmful for the plant as well. It reduces your yield and it is also harmful for the environment. So in such cases, what can be the solution? So they developed a novel strategy here. And the novel strategy is called as RNA interference. So what is RNA interference? You use RNA to stop a particular process. So that process is called, so it is a natural process that is present in your body and my body. So it is a natural eukaryotic defense mechanism that is present. So what happens? So if you guys can recollect when we are talking about the central dogma of life. So what are the central dogma of life? The information on your DNA is being replicated. It is being transcribed on your mRNA and finally being translated into a protein, right? So in the process of transcription, what happens? Both the, So during your process of replication, both the stands of DNA replicate. But when we were talking about transcription particularly, I told you only one strand is being translated. Sorry, one strand is being transcribed. Why so? So you have two strands of DNA in your body. So this is your DNA. So your DNA has been replicated. It is perfectly ready. Now the information has to be copied onto an mRNA. So for information to be copied onto an mRNA, only one of the two strands acts as a template strand, right? Why? Why not both the strands are being copied? W one reason that I gave you was if both the strands are being copied, understand these two are complementary to each other. When this is being transcribed to an mRNA and this is also being transcribed to an mRNA, these two will form a double stranded mRNA. If you have a double stranded mRNA, then the process of translation will not happen, right? So the same principle is what we are going to use here, right? So that is called as RNA interference. So RNA interference is nothing but when you have a particular mRNA being produced, if you produce a complementary mRNA to it, it forms a double stranded mRNA and hence it cannot be translated. So that is called as a process of RNA interference. So we are going to use this novel strategy to have a pest resistant crop. So how it is being done? So it is also a mechanism of silencing. So this is the nematode that is causing problem. So you take the nematode specific genes, okay, and you produce the mRNA of them and insert it inside the plant. So this is the problem causing nematode. So you want to kill this nematode. So you take specific genes of the nematode and introduce them into the host plant. 
So when you take the important genes of a nematode and put it inside a host plant along with the chromosomal DNA, it will also replicate, transcribe and translate, right? Yes. So the double standard RNA will inhibit the specific mRNA. So I know it's pretty confusing. I have a figure here. So understand. <coughs> so this is what is being done. So this is your plant cell. You take a nematode specific gene. So artificially you inject the nematode specific gene. For example, say I am injecting this artificially inside the plant cell. So this is a particular mRNA that is very important for the survival of the nematode. Now this gene is inside your plant. Now the nematode will come and infect the plant. So when it comes and infect the plant, it will also have its normal process going on. So when it has its normal process, it will also have the synthesis of essential pro proteins. So for the essential proteins, first it will undergo replication, transcription and translation, right? So it will also produce a particular mRNA. Now we already have a complementary pair of mRNA. So both of them will come and bind and hence the process of translation is inhibited. So this process will stop. This will kill your entire nematode, right? Yes. So look here, we are inserting a RNA here. Okay. So now the nematode is acting here. So this is the nematode, okay, the nematode is producing an mRNA here. So you have the complementary mRNA right here inside your plant. So this two will come and bind and hence this mRNA is broken into pieces. Once it is broken into pieces, it cannot have a fully developed protein. So that is the process of RNA interference. You block the translation of a particular mRNA by producing or introducing a complementary mRNA stand. Alright. So this is the process of RNA interference. Is that understood? So I spoke to you about two processes in detail. One is Bt cotton. The other one is RNAi. So that is called as RNA interference. So this is about the application of biotechnology in agriculture. So when I say RNA interference, I am inserting a particular gene. So how do I insert? First, I have to chop that piece of gene, right? Okay, so you want me to explain again? Alright, so let me explain it here. See, now you have a nematode. So this nematode is the problem causing for us. We have to kill this nematode because it is infecting our tobacco plant, right? We need a high yield of this tobacco plant. So how are we going to kill this nematode? So first you study the nematode in detail. You identify the genes essential for this nematode to survive. Say for example, you have gene A and gene B that is very essential for the survival of your nematode. Okay. So you have your gene A here. You have your gene B here. So what happens to the gene? So this will be transcribed into a particular mRNA and this will produce protein 1. This will be translated into mRNA and this will produce protein, for example, say P2. And this is essential for your nematode. Now your ultimate aim is to kill this nematode because it is infecting your tobacco plant. So what you will do, you have identified these two important genes. Now you know it is producing an mRNA. So you will artificially synthesize a complementary mRNA to this or to this and you will insert it inside your plant. You will produce the artificially produced complementary mRNA stands inside the plant. Now when the nematode comes and infects your plants, means it is going to infect a particular cell in your plant. So when it's going to infect, it is again going to replicate, transcribe and translate, right? So it will produce this mRNA according to its machinery. So once that mRNA is being produced, you already have inserted a complementary stand. So that will automatically come and bind. So it is forming a double stranded RNA. Double stranded RNA will not allow the process of translation to happen. So no proteins will be produced. If no proteins are produced, the nematode cannot survive. So it's going to die. So you're literally going to block the translation process of your nematode by providing a complementary mRNA inside your plant. So that is all the concept is about. So any doubt? Yes. Now you understood Priyanka what I'm trying to explain. 
So now going back to the slide and explaining it to you. So this is the plant cell. Yes. So you insert double stranded RNA here because you cannot insert a mRNA stand. You are producing a double stranded RNA here. Wait. All right. So so this RNA is being produced with the help of a particular complex. You are chopping it off. Yes. So when you produce a particular RNA, you cannot produce it in the form of mRNA. You produce it in the form of a double stranded RNA. Yes, a double stranded RNA is being introduced into the plant cell. Yes, so that is being cleaved. So exactly that complementary portion is here. The moment your nematode comes and infects, so this will also have your mRNA being produced, right? So, so just like I told you in the figure here. All right. Okay. All right. I'll explain it here only. So this is your plant cell. You are inserting your uh, RNA here. So this RNA is artificially produced and it is complementary to your mRNA of your nematodes. So once this enters and it is being inside your plant cell, the nematode comes and infects your plant cell. The nematodes happening. So the moment the mRNA is produced, the complementary one will actually come and bind to this. If two complementary mRNA stands are formed, your translation is inhibited, right? So that is what I am trying to say. It will not uh, uh, occur every time. So you insert a set of genes. For example, it's going to kill the so many nematodes that is entering your plant. So you will only insert your complementary genes, complementary mRNA strands. So the moment the normal process of your nematode happens, it's going to interfere and it's going to block the translation. You will inject a particular set of genes. So every time you will not be injecting, but you will inject it in one go. How continuous and discontinuous synthesis will occur? You are just going to insert nematode specific genes inside your host cell. That is inside your plants, right? So then how? You are going to insert the gene, alright? Or you are going to insert the artificially produced mRNA. So your plant machinery will also undergo replication, transcription and translation. So if I am inserting nematode specific genes, so whatever is happening here will happen here also. Understand. So this is your nematode. All right. So nematode has specific genes A and B. So you will insert these two genes inside your plant cell. Artificially, you will you will take off these two genes, insert it inside the plant cell, and this, along with the plant chromosomal DNA, will undergo replication, transcription, and translation. Right. So these genes will also produce mRNA. Now, if your uh, uh, tobacco plant is being infected by the nematode, that will also have replication, transcription and translation, right? So, when this has a complementary mRNA and the other complementary is, is present inside the nematode, both will come inside, come in contact and it will form a double stranded RNA, right? So, hence the process of translation will be inhibited. So, don't worry. So, we will go back and I will explain before. Okay, so this is the before slide. Yes. So RNA interference is when you are going to block the process of translation by giving a RNA, a complementary mRNA strand inside your host. So when you have double standard RNA, your process of translation is inhibited. All right. So we are going to do that to your nematode, which is infecting your tobacco plant. So how are we going to do it? We are going to insert specific genes inside the host cell. That is your nematode specific genes inside your host cell. So that the process of translation is inhibited inside your nematode. So that is the en entire concept all right so how it is being done so that's what i was explaining so you insert your nematode specific genes inside your plant so when you insert nematode specific genes so it will undergo pro process of replication transcription and translation so it will produce a complementary mrna which is e very complement to the mrna produced by your nematode right so both of them will form a double stranded rna so once your double stranded rna is being formed the process of translation is inhibited yes yes that's what i'm trying to say so when so here inside the nematode it will have only one process of uh, one strand of dna that is being transcribed but the other one you have artificially given so automatically both will find its partner and it will form a double stranded rna right
So that is why I am saying it is okay if you do not understand. So next class I will explain it in more detail. So we are already running over time. So it is 4.56 already. So you have another class I guess after this. So do not worry it is okay I will explain it again in the next class. So talking about what is new. So your Bt cotton and your RNA interference are old techniques. The moment biotechnology came into birth. So your Bt cotton and your uh, pest resistant plants were discovered. Your Bt brinjal is also one example. So what is new? So what are we talking about today? So are we still in the same track or are we having moved forward? So if you say yes, we have moved forward. We have stunning discoveries here. For example, have you heard tomatoes offer affordable source for Parkinson's disease? So what are Parkinson's disease? So in case of your Parkinson's disease, your particular neurotransmitter called as dopamine is not being properly synthesized, right? So that is the major problem in case of your Parkinson's disease. So Rishi says, hello. Yes, hello. Yes, I am good. Thank you. How are you? So, but how are they using tomatoes to do it? So, they are artificially engineering your tomatoes. So, they are genetically modifying your tomatoes to produce what is called as L dopa. So that is called as levodopa. All right. So, when you can pr produce or modify your tomatoes to produce your levodopa properly, then the process of purification, extraction, commercial process is very easy because tomato is one of the widely grown crops, right? And it is not easy to grow a tomato farm. Sorry, it is not tough and it is not expensive also and the process of extraction is also pretty easy because your tomato is a natural product. So you will not have any side effects. So what did they do? So they produced a tomato enriched in Parkinson's disease drug and the drug is called as L-Dopa. So L-Dopa is called as Levodopa. So this Levodopa is actually synthetically also produced to treat Parkinson's disease. But when you produce it naturally, the consequences, the effects are less. So that is the new discovery that they have come up with. And this is one of the fantastic one. So you know how many people are suffering, in Parkins, uh, suffering with Parkinson's disease today. So it is a major cause and people are trying to come up with an affordable drug. And this is one of the most affordable solution with a tomato. All right. So you can read through it. It is just a recent discovery and this is the hyperlink for that. So you can just open this hyperlink for, for you to get this hyperlink first download the eCareer point app and go into free stuff and under that you will find my PPT. So download then you can click on this hyperlink and you can read more about it how a modified tomato can be used as a drug. So it is something very, very great because for those people who are suffering with Parkinson's, they know the pain. And today, uh, the artificially synthesized levodopa is as expensive and it is also not safe. It has a lot of side effects. So it is one of the natural remedy that people have come up with. All right. So at, uh, genetically modified tomatoes are there. But it's the first time you have modified a tomato to be used as a drug for a particular type of disease. So that is new. So this is a very recent discovery. So this came up only in the 9th of December, I guess. So you can read more about it. So you will understand how practically biotechnology is being used. So with this, we'll stop today's lecture. In the next lecture, we'll talk about how biotechnology is being used in medicine. So that is more important, right? All right. So I will meet you in my menti quiz at 6.30. So until then, stay tuned and bye-bye. So thank you for all those who have been watching my lecture.